from the Gothic Quarter in Barcelona. This is Market Movers, the podcast that gives you a closer look at the financial markets to trade responsibly. Here are your hosts, Lior Cohen and Yohai Elam. Hello and welcome, and thank you for listening. Welcome to another installment of Market Movers. I'm your co-host, Lior Cohen, and joining me, Yochai Elam. Hi, Yochai. Hi, Lior. Great to be here once again. Today, we're going to talk about the correlations, how to use it, and how we might be abusing it. We're going to talk also about the, the latest developments in the, the U.S.-Russia feud. How does it impact uh, oils, uh, gold, and the forex markets? And finally, we'll uh, sign off with uh, the British pound. Does it lose its uh, shine? And where... Uh, and uh, is it in a critical junction and what's up ahead for it? So let's kick it off with something about the uh, correlations. Yochai, you use a lot of uh, correlations when you examine uh, Forex and other uh, assets compared to another, right? That's right. Uh, especially looking at uh, dollar yen, we can see a huge correlation between uh, uh, dollar yen and US yields and dollar yen with stocks. There used to be a good correlation between the euro and European uh, bonds but that's broken at the moment. Okay, that's cool. So one of the things when we use it is we have to think about what are the assumptions that we put into it, how do we use it, and what are what are the problems when when we're facing and looking into correlations between a assets. Now for one thing, correlation thing that we use in order to see a, the relationship between two asset prices. For instance, if we want to see the correlation between the yen and US stocks, we can use a correlation. Or in a commodities, with the relationship between a oil and natural gas prices. Correlation usually runs between one and minus one. One means that there is a very, it basically means it's the same asset. So usually not going to see one correlation. We're going to see something between 0.1 and 0.9. This means strong linear correlation between one price to another. When it's minus, it means a negative correlation. When one, one, when one price goes up, this means the other price tends to go down. The other thing is if it's close to zero, if it's usually between 0.1 to minus 0.1, usually means that there is little correlation. We use it also a better understanding of how one asset moves and compared to the other. And understanding of uh, maybe one asset moves the other asset. For instance, if the US dollar strengthen again most currencies, we could see that gold also tend to decline. But here lies also one of the caveats when using correlations, and that is that correlation doesn't imply causation. Just because asset prices tend to move in the similar direction, it doesn't necessarily mean that one asset has an impact on the other asset. So it doesn't mean that one is a leading one and the other uh, follows it. Exactly. Just because uh, we have two assets that moving in the same direction or in different direction, but have a strong relationship, as uh, for instance, the US dollar and gold, it doesn't mean necessarily in all cases that uh, the US dollar is leading the way for gold. It could be in some in some situation, it can be the case. But just because there is a correlation, it doesn't necessarily mean that one leads the other. The same goes, for instance, with between gold and silver. Gold is a much bigger much bigger market than silver and in most cases it does move silver when gold tends to go up silver will will soon follow because they are in the same family group and they're precious metals people that invest in gold tend also to invest in uh, silver but it doesn't necessarily mean that in all cases in other assets that strong correlation between two sets of prices it means that one has to impact the other so this is one uh, one thing that we should consider the other thing is that the assumptions that go in specifically there are two main assumptions that should be taken into account when people use correlations. For one thing is the distribution of the asset price. Normally, people just assume price asset has normal distribution. The normal distribution, as you well know, is something that's uh, like a hump that goes uh, sliding down and uh, most of the distribution is in the middle and a little bit uh, at, the, at the edges. So roughly 95% of the distribution is in the middle and the five remaining 5% 5 are in the fringe. Now, this means that the, the, the chance of something to occur which is very unlikely Likely, let's say something that is roughly three, four uh, standard deviations away from the average is very low. The black swan event. Yes, exactly. Now, that means that there is very low chance of a black swan. And how low? It means that, for instance, the S&P to drop by 20% in one day has... Uh, 
nearly zero chance of happening. It could have been something once in a uh, hundred years, 200 years. But in effect, we have seen it over the past 50 years more than once. And uh, we can recall if it was uh, back in 2007, eight, uh, the colla market collapse in uh, 87, in 2000, in the early 2000s, or the internet bubble crash. There are bubbles and they have occurred and thus the distribution doesn't necessarily mean it's a normal distribution. It might be something else, something with a fat tail distribution called Cauchy distribution, but we're not into a math class, so it doesn't matter the name. We're just trying to figure out what does it mean. So it's more likely that there are other assets such as the S&P or oil or gold have a much more fatter tail distribution. So unlikely events, if you will, have a more, more probability of actually occurring. So this one, this is one of the assumptions that go into when you use a correlation. So we might not be using correlation uh, rightly so if the distribution, and this is the case in most assets, is not uh, normal. The other, the other thing to consider is that the linear relationship, and that means that when one price goes up, the other goes up. So when we have a linear correlation, it means that uh, the relationship is uh, is constant throughout time, and this is also something that doesn't necessarily happen in most cases. So this is another assumption that go into when you use a correlation. So what does it mean to us? It means that when you use it, you should also take it with a grain of salt because it might not hold up over time. It, it not might be uh, the assets that you're looking for aren't a normal distribution. And also the linear correlation uh, must might not be linear. It could have other properties. Maybe it could be non-linear, uh, such as something that goes up throughout time, or something that is more of a more of a curvature. So there are other other possibilities that could happen, and thus you should take that that into account. So the other thing is to consider is that when we have suddenly a sharp uh, change in market in the markets, such as uh, back in 2008, these kind of correlations will all evaporate and won't hold up. So when there are sharp changes in the in the high volatility and sharp moves, that's when you know that these correlations won't hold up and that's way when you should less consider them as more reliable. So these kind of things are more practices that are more reliable when there is more of a steady state kind of economy and when they where there's a very low volatility and when there are other very, very low probability of sudden shocks. So that's where you could use it and again still use it with a grain of salt. I'll just add that uh, regarding the euro, We've seen recently the correlation between uh, various bonds of European countries, such as Germany, Spain, Portugal, doesn't matter if they're core countries or peripheral countries. This correlation with the value of the euro has broken down. So if we're looking at euro dollar, the pair depends only at the moment, only on what happens in the United States. So it doesn't mean we're going to see a huge change of direction. We, we, we do see euro dollar dropping, but we're not seeing a huge move. But it does mean that uh, European events such as European indicators will probably move euro dollar much less than any news coming out of the United States. All right. So, okay, moving right along, we have the big news uh, that coming not from the Middle East, even though that's something that it's pretty close to it. It's something that could have an impact on the on financial markets is the, the recent feud between the US and Russia following the tragic shooting down of the Malaysian uh, airplane from uh, go moving from uh, Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. These uh, tragic events also had a little bit of a, an impact on uh, the financial markets. Specifically, we saw a sharp rise immediately following the escalation in the relationship between the US and Russia. There was a sharp rise in uh, gold and oil and other commodity prices. But then it uh, wind down a little bit and now it's still there's still big news coming from that region but does it have any implications on the financial markets looking forward and what does it mean for the fundamentals so let's uh, kick it off for for you uh, yohai what's your take on uh, the recent events and how do you think these news could have an impact on the financial markets well uh, last thursday was quite uh, deadly both israel launched its ground offensive in gaza and which is still going on at the time of this recording and uh, the Malaysian plane was downed by rebels, probably uh, pro-Russian rebels, but we don't know that for sure. So what happened is the immediate uh, reaction of fear. When the Russian stock market fell, that's natural, uh, price of oil went up, and 
in general, stock markets also uh, drop. Now, if we look into currency markets, we, we saw on Thursday and in the days afterwards that the Japanese yen strengthened. The Japanese yen is a safe haven currency, not because Japan is safer than any other country, but because of the traditionally and almost omnipresent low yields in Japan. This there, it means that the yen is used as a lending currency, as a carry trade, in order to buy higher yielding currencies. On Thursday, we had a really bloody day. And in the afternoon, European afternoon, the Malaysian uh, plane was downed. And later in that evening, Israel launched its ground offensive in Gaza. So we've seen some uh, fear-related action in the markets. We've seen uh, stock markets fall, especially in Russia, but not only there. We've seen the price of oil rise. We've seen the uh, Japanese yen climb. The Japanese yen is considered a safe haven currency. Why is that? Not because Japan is safer, but because Japan traditionally has low rates and its currency is used uh, to buy other currencies which provide a higher yield. So, in times of trouble, this money is repatriated, if you wish, or uh, undone, risk is undone, and money flows into Japan. Or at least speculators think that money will flow into Japan and buy the Japanese yen. But after a few days, after it's not news, but rather just a situation, things are unwound. So what we've seen also on this occasion is a drop of dollar yen, for example, a drop of stock markets. And then when things don't actually calm down, but... Uh, begin repeating themselves. I mean, many more people are killed in Gaza and uh, the tensions are still high between uh, Russia and Ukraine. But there is nothing really big that's new. So what's going on in the markets is uh, we're seeing recovery, we're seeing dollar yen uh, and the yen in general. I mean, dollar yen rise and the yen in general fall back down. So what can we as traders do about this? If it's really, really bad news, okay, the reaction could be justified. But in most cases in the past few years, since the financial crisis, it just provides opportunity to buy the dips, if you wish, to seize the opportunity of fear, go against the trend. Yet again, I don't recommend using high leverage in these cases, but and taking the opportunity to profit on that. Uh, this thing began back in the 18th century or 19th with the Rothschild family, and it it's relevant once again when there's blood on the streets it's time to buy uh that may be a bit harsh but that's reality that's how you make money yeah yeah, yeah. uh markets uh, continue to operate and uh, we have uh, chances here more safe haven currencies the dollar is also sort of a mild safe haven currency uh, also because it's the reserve currency of the world and it has low yields for the past five years. The Swiss franc used to be a safe haven as well, but the past three years, or nearly three years, it's pegged to the euro, making it basically irrelevant and quite a boring currency. So in currency markets, uh, the yen is the real focus in uh, times of fear. So we saw that uh, following the news after that, uh, we saw a immediate rise in buys for uh, the yen, and, then, uh, and now you see that it's gonna come down a little bit. Yeah, we've already seen the yen uh, come back down against the US dollar from the peak that it reached uh, in the immediate aftermath of these uh, terrible events. So if we have another eruption of violence either in the Middle East or either an escalation of the tensions in, in Ukraine, we could see the yen strengthen again. But if uh, no news from those regions emerges, I think the yen uh, could continue uh, descending, especially against the US dollar, which is on the rise. Oh, so we'll see the the end continue to slowly descend and and actually resume its uh, descend uh, that it already had in the past couple of years or so because the Bank of Japan is continue continues with, with its efforts to devalue the the yen against leading currencies, specifically the U.S. dollar. Exactly. Yeah, okay, so we're going to see that. And uh, in regards to the commodities markets, we saw that as the same way as uh, the yen. Immediately after after the news erupted uh, last week, we saw a spike in oil prices, in gold prices. But after that, in the days that followed, in the last couple of days or so, oil prices came back down and lost uh, most of uh, its gains from uh, last week. And when you look at the fundamentals, you say, hey, you know, Russia is still the second largest producer of na dry natural gas and the third largest of uh, liquid fuels in the world, then that means something. And of course, it does mean, but since it doesn't necessarily mean that Russia will start will stop sending out oil for some reason because it still uh, produces 10.5 million barrels per day and exports 
7 million back at least wow. back in 2002 so we so most so roughly 70 percent of its of its output it sells to other countries and the u.s it's only four percent of the of the u.s imports come from russia so it's not a big player when it comes to the u.s the u.s won't have any direct implications and adverse impact from this kind of feud at least from the oil perspective and thus uh, all the wti which is uh, the us uh, oil should come down won't be affected by much from uh, the recent events in russia and even if tensions between russia and us will continue to to rise it still doesn't mean that it will have any direct impact at least for the us in regards to oil Right. Uh, Europe uh, is more affected by any sanctions on Russia. It has much closer trade uh, ties. And uh, Europe, uh, especially Germany, imports a lot of uh, gas from Russia. France has an agreement with Russia to sell some warships. So Europe, we've seen European countries a bit reluctant uh, to announce new sanctions on Russia as they will suffer much more. Yes, they suffer much more and still the Brent oil is still has a premium over the WTI. So the Europeans are paying much more for oil than the US. Not to mention that when it comes to gasoline prices, there's also the taxes that they are uh, implemented uh, throughout Europe, but none in the US. So for the price per gallon in Europe is significantly more higher than in the US. So nobody want to hold on to this uh, third rail and start uh, putting some sanctions on the third largest producer of oil, which could have some major adverse impact on the on the oil market, at least in Europe and uh, throughout Asia. So, okay, there is that. Okay, and moving right along, we have the British pound. It's uh, losing a little bit of its uh, shine. That's uh, what you said, Yuhai. You have to back it up now. Yeah, yeah, we <laughs> had our chance to produce a, a lot of nice uh, headlines with sterling and the shine and uh, uh, all these kind of headlines, but... Uh, You're all full of puns. Yeah, yeah, we're doing our best to uh, push as many puns as possible. Anyway, we've seen the uh, British pound strengthen very, very nicely against the US dollar, against the euro, also against other currencies. All the signs in the British economy have been positive. However, after uh, pound dollar reached nearly 172 and uh, euro pound dropped below 79 cents things have changed a bit for the british pound especially against the us dollar so here are the contradicting signs we've seen recently on one hand inflation is on the rise it reached uh, 1.9 percent in june uh, higher than expected and very very close to the uh, target um, but uh, on the other hand, wage inflation uh, rose by only 0.3%. So once again, we have uh, external prices rising, one-time effects, but people are earning uh, less money. Uh, we've seen it also with the unemployment rate, which uh, even though it dropped to 6.5%, which is already far off the original target of 7% uh, introduced originally by the uh, Bank of England, the good news does not translate into a stronger pound because, yet again, salaries are not moving fast. Other figures from uh, the UK uh, contradicting as well. Purchasing managers' indices, forward-looking indices from market, are strong. Services and manufacturing are around seven, uh, 57, 58 points, which sig means strong growth. And construction is even above 60, which means steaming hot growth. But we had an upset from the manufacturing production and industrial production. The manufacturing dropped by 1.7% in uh, May. That was a big surprise. Uh, it contradicted the PMIs. And that was the first warning sign. Now moving on to what's going on this week. We have the meeting minutes of the MPC, the Monetary Policy Committee. It still showed a unanimous vote of 9 against zero to maintain the interest rates unchanged by the way this this is what happened in the past uh, what year or so or even two years when was the last time that it wasn't a unanimous vote i mean this is something that these guys are uh, pretty adamant in keeping the interest rate uh, unchanged is there any uh, does carney is, seem to think he's gonna change it uh, anytime soon carney did hint about raising the rates but since he came into power uh, that was about one year ago uh, all the members of the MPC, the old ones, the new ones, everyone uh, aligned by, by his measures and nobody dissented. Uh, something that we've seen several times in the past under uh, previous governor Mervyn King, uh, or better said, Sir Mervyn King. 
Uh, Sir Merver King, yeah, yeah. Hail, hail the king. But th did the king so the king had a uh, people that opposed him? That's yeah, what you're yeah. saying. In fact, Sir King was outvoted more than once, especially towards his uh, last days as the governor. Um, so, but so far everybody's behind Carney. We have potentials like uh, Martin Wheel, uh, Spencer Dale, members of the NPC that were expecting them at some stage to descend and to vote for an early r rate hike. So far, this hasn't happened. However, the Monetary Policy Committee did send some shots across the bow. They said that the danger from rising rates to the recovery has receded. That means they're not afraid to raise the rates sooner. But will it happen? Not so fast. Yet again, we return to the issue of salaries. Slow wage growth means that there is more slack in the economy. Read the meeting minutes. And they also expect slower growth in the second half. So they're trying, I think, uh, to manage expectations. I'm not sure they're doing it really well but the data will tell us more. So we have the retail sales, they're expected to show a recovery in June after uh, a drop in May. However, the early elimination of uh, the England team in the World Cup might have a negative impact because it does impact sales. So, so we still have a residual impact from the World Cup on the UK economy. Really? That, that has such a substantial impact on the, the UK economy? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's what all uh, British experts, analysts say, that uh, the sales of t-shirts, TVs, other merchandise related to the team, beer, everything. Of course, well, beer, of course, yeah, that, you don't have to convince me of that, yeah, that's pretty self-evident. Yeah. yeah, don't drink and pray, by the way. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very sound advice. That, that's the only thing. I think we're gonna finish on the high note. That's it. Thank you and good night. Yeah. <laughs> don't don't drink. Don't drink and trade. Yeah. There we go. That's our new slogan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but just before we, we can begin uh, opening our cans of beer towards the weekend, we have another last important release in the UK, and that's the first release of GDP growth for the second quarter of the year. The first release always has the strongest impact because it's the first one, of course. The next ones usually see very small revisions. Another thing to note what, um, is that uh, we expect a growth rate of 0.8 quarter on quarter, and that's what we've seen in Q1 and also in Q4. Because the growth rate has been so similar or exact, same level of growth in the past uh, quarters any deviation from this if it's 0 0.7 or 0 0.9 will likely have a strong impact on the pound and the year-on-year -year, uh, growth rate is expected to be 3.1 percent a bit stronger than three percent that's higher than in the u.s if we get these figures i think the pound could resume its rises and bounce off the 170 level which it when it's hovering above. But if we'll have another disappointment, uh, 0.7 or even 0.6, the 170 level, which is a critical level, could be broken. More levels on the pound well, from top to bottom, uh, 171.90, the, the recent peak, 171.40, 171.70, 170.30, which is now a friction point, uh, 170, of course, and below 170, the next level is 169. Uh, 40. More data is on uh, our websites. Okay, excellent. So you say that uh, when it comes to the British uh, pound, if we see suddenly that the GDP goes uh, well above the 0.8% that it was in the past uh, several couple of quarters and what is expected now, we could see a, a sharp movement in the British pound. Yeah, we can see a sharp movement uh, on the immediate release and the hours afterwards, and also in the days afterwards. This is quite a big release uh, due to the fact that uh, growth has been strong, but very, very steady. Any move towards a different uh, growth rate will have a strong impact uh, for the weeks to come. All right. So if we'll see suddenly, so suddenly, for instance, a 1% increase, they'll strengthen the British pound compared to other currencies. And right. We could see 172 break on, on uh, cable and and uh, 78 cents on euro pound break as well. All right. Thank you, Hi. Thank you, Lior. Thank you for another installment. Thank, thank you all for listening. Uh, that's it. Until uh, next time, this is uh, Lior for signing off for you, Hi, saying and have a, an excellent week. For comments, suggestions, and questions, visit the podcast page at forexcrunch.com or tradingnrg.com where you can also find past episodes and subscribe to the show. Our listeners make market movers possible.